Uh, our next presentation will be by uh, Mary Schmitz. Uh, Mary Schmitz has nine years of experience providing technical support for HIV AIDS nutrition and maternal child health programs, primarily in East Africa with NGOs and government agencies. She holds a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and anthropology and a master's in public health degree. And she'll be discussing about HIV exposed infant analysis results from an innovative method for routinely monitoring longitudinal outcomes of HIV exposed infants in Kenya. Okay, um, good morning. And I'd first like to thank the conference organizers for this opportunity to share Kenya's results from a new method to routinely monitor longitudinal outcomes of HIV exposed infants. I'm presenting on behalf of a team from the Kenyan Ministry of Health and the Centers for, for Disease Control and Prevention in Kenya. We know that globally, mother to child HIV transmission has reduced by 35% since 2009. In 2012, an estimated 260,000 infants were infected globally, of whom 13,000, or about 5%, were from Kenya. While virologic laboratory data are available to track early infant diagnosis, less is known regarding HIV-exposed infant follow-up through the recommended 18-month period in breastfeeding populations. We developed the HIV-exposed infant cohort analysis system to routinely assess prevention of mother-to-child transmission outcomes towards the elimination target of MTCT less than 5% by 2015. I'll refer to the system as HCA throughout the presentation and use the term HAY or infants for HIV-exposed infants. HCA is based on Kenyan guidelines for HAY services, which include ARV prophylaxis, HIV testing at six weeks, nine months, and 18 months, and exclusive breastfeeding to six months with cessation by 12 months. HCA is done on a monthly basis, whereby healthcare workers abstract aggregated birth cohort data from the HAY longitudinal register to determine nine and 18 month infant outcomes and service uptake. And this is among infants who are enrolled in follow-up in that facility. Data are analyzed using frequencies and reported upward alongside other routine reports. This diagram summarizes HCA, which is split into two reviews over the first two years of life. The first review, shown in green, covers a period from birth to nine months and is calculated when the cohort reaches 12 months of age. The second review, shown in blue, covers the entire period from birth to 18 months and is done when the cohort attains 24 months of age. Indicators 10 and 13 are disaggregated outcome indicators whereby every infant is assigned one outcome as per their status at nine or 18 months. Here we show an example of HCA tool use for the report that would have been generated in January 2014. We begin with the HCA summary sheet for the 2013 birth cohort to conduct the first review for the January 2013 cohort as they would have attained 12 months by January 2014. This is marked in green. And we can note that the second review for this cohort will be done in January 2015, which we haven't shown here. Then we use the 2012 birth cohort summary sheet to conduct the second review for the January 2012 cohort as they would have attained 24 months in January 2014, marked in blue. And we can note that the first review for this cohort would have been done in January 2013 when they were 12 months of age. Moving to the middle, we fill the monthly report form for upward reporting. And then we would track performance on facility progress wall charts for 2012 and 2013 birth cohorts. And finally, we summarize findings and action items to improve performance using the tool shown or other relevant quality improvement tools in use by the facility. Health facilities began implementing HCA in July 2013, and rollout has been ongoing since. By June 2014, 1,471, or about 30% of Kenya's PMTCT sites were reporting. Today, we are sharing results from facility reports received between July 2013 and June 2014. 
This chart shows the uptake of HIV services by nine months in the cohort born in July 2012 to June 2013, which has a total of 21,712 infants. The light green bars on the left are performance, and dark green bars on the right are program targets. For the area of ARVs, 90% of mothers and infants were documented to have received ARV prophylaxis. For first PCR, 81% of enrolled infants received a first PCR test by two months, while an overall 91% had received a PCR at any time before nine months. And we can note that of the infants tested by two months, 3.7% were HIV positive. For nine-month testing, 82% of eligible infants were tested by antibody, and among those with a positive antibody test, half received confirmatory PCR testing and reported exclusive breastfeeding was 79% at six months. This pie chart shows the overall outcomes for the nine-month review of the same cohort born in July 2012 to June 2013. Shown in green, 79% of infants were HIV negative and continuing on follow-up. 4% were identified as HIV positive, and 5% were transferred out. 10% had missed their nine-month follow-up visit, shown in purple, and 2% had died by nine months. And of those who were HIV positive, 86% were linked to HIV care. This pie chart shows the overall outcomes for the 18-month review of the cohort born in July 2011 to June 2012, which had a total of 21,370 infants. And it's important for us to note that this is a different birth cohort from the previous slides on the first review of nine-month outcomes. Shown in green, 65% had attended their 18-month visit and were tested antibody negative, while 2% attended but did not have an antibody test result. 6% had been identified HIV positive and 10% were transferred out. 14% were lost to follow-up, shown in purple again, and 3% had died. And similar to the previous cohort, of those who were HIV positive, 85% were linked to HIV care. Now let's look briefly at how we might adjust the overall proportions to estimate an 18-month MTCT rate for the July 2011 to June 2012 cohort. The first row shows what was reported in the previous pie chart with no adjustment. For this presentation, we removed infants who are missing a final status due to transferring out, being lost to follow-up, or having attended the 18-month visit but not having an antibody test result. When we do this adjustment, we see the estimated 18-month MTCT rate increases to 8.3%. Furthermore, if we include death as a common endpoint, we go up to 12.5% positive or died at 18 months. This figure is notably closer to the 2012 UNAIDS Kenya population-based estimate of 15% transmission through the breastfeeding period. In summary, we note that among infants enrolled in follow-up at HCA reporting facilities, our target was met for maternal and infant ARVs, but a 10% gap still remains. Uptake of PCR by nine months is high at 90, 91%, but antibody testing and confirmatory PCR at nine months is suboptimal at 82 and 50% respectively. Loss to follow-up at nine and 18 months met our target. However, we are aiming to reduce to near zero in the context of EMTCT. And the proportion positive at six weeks, nine and 18 months are all above the elimination targets and more concerning may increase to greater than eight or 12% at 18 months, depending on adjustment and endpoint used. And finally, linkage to care among HIV-infected infants is suboptimal, with 15% not documented as linked. HCA has several limitations. First, complete and accurate documentation in the primary data source is necessary in order to conduct meaningful analysis. Individual level effectiveness of interventions also cannot be assessed as data are aggregate. And we can note that HCA should be considered complementary, not a replacement of traditional surveillance, cross-sectional surveys, and use of EMR data. 
HCA is based on facility enrollment and not population data. However, this would not preclude us from further analyzing and comparing with population estimates once we, once we have more coverage of HCA reporting facilities. And finally, HCA focuses on infants and has limited maternal information. And this is largely because we lack a joint maternal and infant follow-up register in our current tools in use in Kenya. In conclusion, routine facility-based Haycord analysis is feasible and useful in evaluating program performance, most notably here where we have highlighted the large gap in meeting our EMTCT targets through the breastfeeding period. Our next steps include integration within the national HIV reporting tools and health information system, as well as continuing scale up to more facilities. We will also continue mentorship with a focus on data use for program improvement as part of the broader EMTCT strategy in Kenya. And I would just like to acknowledge the institutions and groups shown on this slide, as well as one member, Dr. Irene McCoy of the Kenyan Ministry of Health, who is present here today. And a very special thank you to the healthcare workers and the implementing partners supporting them that have incorporated HCA into their routine efforts towards elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. Yes, up at the back, Mike. Oh, hi, it's a great presentation. Um, I'm Colin Spate from the Lighthouse Clinic in Malawi. I just wanted to get your thoughts on the major limitation of early infant diagnosis program, which is that the infants that are tested are the infants of the mothers who are on ART. All of the infants of the mothers who've been lost to follow-up, who've defaulted, who were never tested, who never started taking ART, do not get enrolled, they do not get engaged in early infant diagnosis, so we're not testing them. These are the infants that are actually at much, much higher risk of getting HIV, 25 to 30%, as opposed to 2 or 3% for the women on ART. So I think EID results give a very falsely uh, positive view of the rates of transmission. And this is also in addition to mothers who seroconvert later during the breastfeeding period, which again is missed. And I think in terms of um, elimination of mother-child trans transmission, unless these are addressed through perhaps routine testing in uh, sort of the postnatal period of infants, there's no way that these kids are going to get tested and get diagnosed. Right. Um, yes, thank you for your question. And I would fully agree with you. I think um, in the context of this presentation, we were sharing as a, a it's a, a sort of a quality improvement tool to ensure that, at least for the infants that do get enrolled in follow-up, that we're doing the right thing. In terms of the broader question that you raise, however, Kenya is integrating a comprehensive strategy that have many of the strategies that have been mentioned across presentations at this conference. So improving PITC across all entry points to care, OPD, immunization, um, inpatient pediatric wards. And I think um, although this tool is not designed to look at patient level outcomes and predictors of um, excuse me, of uh, infection. I think that anecdotally, as we've gone around the facilities, most times um, nurses will note that it's the infants who came in late. Um, you'll note we only had 81% uh, were tested by two months. So the remaining 10% that got their, nine, their test, a PCR before nine months, perhaps those are infants that came in late and were identified through those other um, entry points. So I think in the interest of time, I may just leave it at that, but I, I fully agree with you that that we have to go beyond just the mother and baby pairs that are enrolled and already included in the follow-up through, um, uh, through identification during the ANC period. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll come back to a general discussion at the end.